Hi, welcome back to General Toxicology. This is part two. We have already dealt with some aspects of general toxicology in part one, including, uh, if I remember right, some uh, definitions, classification, some of the laws. We look at part two today. There may be a little bit of overlap, does not matter. That will be like uh, refreshing your memory. So we will look at again some important definitions, common types of poisons in Kerala that will come a little later, even though I put it as number two. Maybe it will come in part three or part four. Classification of poisons, yes, we have already dealt with. Indian laws, we'll uh, discuss some more. Criminal issues on poisoning, we'll deal with a little bit in detail today. General management of poisoning, we hope to start either in this session or maybe in part three. And of course, we will wind up with uh, what are the duties of doctors in a case of poisoning, especially medical legal duties. So let's uh, start off with uh, laws on uh, poisons. We have already looked at some of the laws. We will look at uh, some others also which we did not deal with in the previous session. We looked at Poisons Act, I think, 1919. Not very important. It is uh, more or less obsolete. Does not apply anymore. Drugs and Cosmetics Act is an important act, passed in 1940. Drugs and Cosmetics Rules is even more important, 1945. Pharmacy Act, 1948. Drugs Control Act, 1950. Drugs and Magic Remedies Act, 1954. And of course, Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act, 1985, amended 88. Some of these things, part one has the details. If you are interested, you can take a look at part one of General Toxicology. Here we will look at drugs and cosmetics rules briefly, though importance is with uh, pharmacology more than toxicology, but there is always a little bit of uh, overlap between the two. These rules have classified all therapeutic drugs into various schedules as follows, as you see on the slide. Schedule C is a list of biological products, E is a list of poisons, F vaccines and sera, G is hormonal preparations, H comprises prescription drugs, J is a list of diseases for which drugs must not be advertised, unethical, and Schedule L, antibiotics, antihistamines, chemotherapeutic agents. Details are not really necessary for those who are just looking at uh, basics of toxicology. If you are uh, going to go into the depth of toxicology, naturally you'll have to look at each of these schedules in detail. With regard to Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act, very important for especially those who deal with forensic aspects of toxicology or medical legal aspects, this was passed in 85, amended 1988, and uh, there are some aspects that we need to look at as far as this act is concerned. This is confusing. When we say narcotic in uh, medical terms, we talk of something that is sleep inducing or maybe dream inducing, isn't it? Narcotics, for instance, opium, derivatives like opiates, opioids. But as far as the law is concerned, NDPS Act is concerned, narcotic drug does not just mean opiates and opioids, but also strangely cannabis and even cocaine. While we know that uh, neither of these, strictly speaking, is a narcotic, cocaine is the very antithesis of a narcotic. It's a powerful stimulant. But that's how law has classified. So we need to remember that. Psychotropic substance under this act means any mind-altering drug. Anything which causes, for instance, hallucinations, disorientation, confusion, and of course, euphoria. So you have a number of drugs here, including LSD, which is a very powerful hallucinogen. Close to that is fencyclidine, amphetamines, which are stimulants, barbiturates, benzodiazepines, methaqualone, 
which was very popular in the 70s and 80s as a substance of abuse, may not be all that poison or not all that popular today. It went by the brand name uh, Mandrax, if I remember right, in uh, India or Qualudes in the West. Then you have Mescaline, which is derived from uh, Cactus, Psilocybin, which is derived from Mushroom and a number of designer drugs which go by, you know, exotic names like Ecstasy, Adam, Eve. We look at all this in detail in a session devoted to substances of abuse. This is only to brief you about Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act and these are the important things that you need to remember. There's also the fact that uh, this particular act uh, is to do with prohibition, total prohibition on cultivation, manufacture, sale, transport of all specified drugs. There are so many drugs which are specified aside from the ones that I listed just now. And um, this act deals with all these aspects to do with such drugs. Minimum punishment specified for major offenses in the act, 10 years rigorous imprisonment and can uh, also involve payment of hefty fines. Maximum is said to be 20 years with fine and uh, repeat offense, especially for major offenses, there is enhanced punish punishment, uh, scope for even death penalty. Though I'm not very sure whether anybody has really been sentenced to death in a case of uh, uh, offense relating to NDPS Act. I don't think so far that has been done, but there is uh, scope for that in the Act. All right, let's look at forensic toxicology because that is uh, uh, often the focus with regard to students, medical students in India, uh, where toxicology is attached to forensic medicine and they take, you know, toxicology as part of forensic medicine in the examinations. So a lot of emphasis, unfortunately, on forensic toxicology, sometimes at the cost of uh, other aspects of toxicology. But we will deal with all aspects. In this particular session, we will look at some of the important forensic aspects of toxicology and that is forensic toxicology. When you look at uh, forensic toxicology, naturally, we have to look at the laws first, isn't it? The laws in the sense that not really the kind of acts that have been discussing so far, acts of parliament, but we are looking at uh, sections, for instance, in the Indian Penal Code or other you know, kinds of statutes to do with criminal offenses relating to poisoning. So forensic toxicology is a branch of toxicology that deals with the criminal use of poisons and the investigation and detection of such criminal use. That is the definition of forensic toxicology. Though I know I gave a very kind of, you know, basic kind of definition in part one, but this is the actual definition of forensic toxicology. When you look at criminal law in India pertaining to poisons, we have some important sections of the Indian Penal Code that you must remember may not be all that relevant to other countries, but I'm talking mainly from the Indian point of view, Indian perspective, this particular section, when you say criminal law, we will be focusing on Indian law, especially Indian Penal Code or IPC. So you have section 8, 284, very important section of the Indian Penal Code that deals with culpable negligence in relation to poisons or dangerous drugs. Punishment can be six months or fine or both, 299, is a general kind of section, not confined to toxicology, but other kinds of offenses are also included here, where there is a culpable homicide by any manner, including use of poison. And the punishment can be life in prison. 300 is to do with culpable homicide amounting to murder. And this again is a general kind of section, not just confined to poisons. This uh, can include all kinds of methods of uh, committing murder, including use of a poisonous substance. So punishment is death or life in prison. And then you have other sections also which are important to remember. 304A is a death caused by rash or negligent act by any means including poisons. Two years of fine of both. 324 again a general section causing hurt by any weapons or means including poisons. Three years of fine of both is a punishment. 326, grievous hurt by any weapons or means, including poisons. 
10 years to life is a punishment. And finally, you have 328, again, uh, confined or restricted to poisons. Deals with deliberately causing hurt by poison or drug that is specified here, punishment 10 years. So, as far as toxicology is concerned, we need to remember two specific sections in the Indian Penal Code. One is uh, 284 and the other is 328. The others which I have listed, you know, in these two slides are not restricted to poisons, but by, you know, or, or can also include uh, other methods or means of committing offenses. Moving on, let us look at uh, some practical aspects of forensic toxicology. Like for instance, you may be a police officer or doctor or investigator or first responder in a scene. When do you suspect that it is a case of poisoning, especially from the medical point of view, when you look at uh, poisoning, what are the signs or symptoms that you must suspect? First, we look at the person who is still living, he's having some manifestations and you're examining him, you're maybe talking to him. And as a doctor, you should know as to what are these clues that you should look for to suspect poisoning. Number one, sudden unexplained weakness or fainting or giddiness or loss of consciousness without anything else to explain it. Very significant. And that is an important clue that the person may be exposed to some kind of toxin. Unexplained stomach ache, headache or body ache, also important, especially if there are no other causes to explain. I'm you know, listing all this with uh, uh, emphasis on the fact that these manifestations are not explained in the person by any you know, presence of any disease or any other affliction. When all those have been excluded, only then you start to suspect poisoning. Then you have sudden onset of vomiting or diarrhea without you know, apparent cause. You have ruled out maybe food poisoning. Then you have to suspect exposure to some toxic substance. Progressive illness for which diagnosis is unclear can indicate chronic poisoning. Periodic illness, alternating with the good health, also important to remember in chronic poisoning. Somebody may be periodically poisoning somebody. So it may not be a continuous kind of exposure. These are all important clues in the case of a living person, aside from, of course, changes like, for instance, unexplained hair loss or skin changes or weight loss or visual problems where other causes have been excluded. You must think of poisoning, acute or chronic. Coming to a dead victim at the scene, whether you're a doctor or a police officer or first responder, whatever it is, what should you look for? How did he die? Did he die unexpectedly? That's a key word here. Sudden unexpected death. Yes, suspicion of poisoning must be there. Or death associated with vomiting, stomach ache, diarrhea. Unexplained death of a child or healthy adult where you don't, you know, expect that person to die is again a, a, a kind of situation which should arouse suspicion. Or death associated with convulsions in a non-epileptic victim. If it is uh, somebody who has got a history of this affliction, then of course that's a different matter. But if somebody all of a sudden develops convulsions and frothing in the mouth and all that, you have to suspect that it could be exposure to some poisonous substance. And uh, then it may be a case of slow death, which was associated with neurological problems or nausea, weakness, hair loss, all this, you know, you can get from the history. These are the things which you should look for in a case of death where, you know, poisoning is uh, suspected. All right, as a doctor especially, though this is important for police officers and investigators also, what are the postmortem signs of poisoning in a dead body? What should you look for, especially at autopsy? There are a number of, you know, features that you should be aware of and that you should be looking at uh, in a case, but these are the most important ones. Evidence of vomitors or stools in and around the dead body, on the clothes, at the scene, very important. Frothing, froth being present at the mouth or the nose in a dead body, at the time of autopsy or maybe even at the scene. If you look at uh, something like this and there is nothing else to explain, again, froth is an important sign that can indicate poisoning. 
bluish face or extremities, intricate cyanosis and uh, respiratory failure, if it cannot be accounted for by anything else, then again you have to suspect that it could be a case of poisoning. Unusual smell in the vicinity of the corpse, especially if it is pronounced on opening up the body at autopsy and uh, you make out some unusual smell, for instance the gastric contents, extremely important finding. Peculiar staining of clothes or skin, which cannot be accounted for by anything else. Signs of forcible feeding or injection marks, very, very significant, very important. And of course, there are some poisons, though we should not really place too much of importance here on this aspect. There are some poisons which do retard decomposition processes. So when you uh, look at a dead body and you find that the stage of decomposition is not uh, fitting into the timeline, uh, expected timeline, then again you must uh, maybe suspect that it's a poison that retards the decomposition process. An example would be arsenic, but we'll look at that in detail when we'll discuss heavy metals. As a police officer especially, at a scene of uh, death due to suspected poisoning or applies also to other investigators like crime scene specialists or first responders, what are the things to be done at the scene so that evidence is not lost? And later on, you know, it becomes difficult, uh, even if it is found that it's a case of suspected homicide, it may be difficult to prove it or to, you know, fix the guilt on a suspect who has been taken into custody. So you need to be very careful with evidence at the scene. Preserving evidence at the scene is extremely important. And uh, as I have just now given you the, you know, findings at autopsy, a qualified forensic pathologist is always desirable to uh, just any doctor, but if a forensic pathologist is not available instead of wasting time, maybe you can get the body examined uh, at the scene and subsequently at autopsy by a, a doctor, maybe an MBBS doctor also would do. Ensure that uh, re relevant body fluids and viscera are preserved for chemical analysis. We'll come to that in a short while. Do not allow cremation of dead body as far as possible unless you are sure that the investigation process is complete. Once you burn the dead body, you burn the evidence and after that there is no going back. So before you allow for cremation especially, burial is not all that, uh, uh, not all that important but from the forensic point of view, cremating a dead body means uh, no, the end of evidence. So you have to be very clear, very sure that all evidence has been collected. And as far as possible, consult a toxicologist or a poison control center for guidance in those cases where you are not very sure uh, about how to proceed. Alright, this is a favorite question especially for students in the examination, medical students. And this is also important for all doctors who are dealing with cases of uh, poisoning, uh, especially dead victims. Uh, what are the kinds of viscera, body fluids that you should preserve from the dead body for analysis? for submission to the forensic science laboratory or the chemical examiner's laboratory. I am giving you a list which uh, is a little difficult to remember, so you may have to come back to this uh, slide again and again to make sure that you have got everything you know, right. We will look at first of all routine viscera, body fluids that must be preserved in every case of poisoning, whatever be the nature of poison. In every case of suspected or confirmed you know, kind of poisoning, in order to perform analysis and prove it in a court of law, these are the viscera and body fluids that must be mandatorily preserved. Number one, stomach and contents. All, all the full contents, don't you know, just take a little bit. The full stomach and contents. Small intestine is a you know, very long you know, kind of uh, structure, so you can't really preserve the entire length. First 30 centimeters is usually what is recommended along with the contents. Liver, preferably 500 grams, minced or cut into small pieces. One kidney or one half of each kidney. Blood about 10 ml from a peripheral vein, not from the heart. And urine about 50 ml, if it is present in the bladder. You can either scoop it out after opening the bladder at autopsy or you can take a catheterized you know, sample from the dead body. So these are the routine viscera and body fluids that must be preserved in every case of poisoning. No question that you should neglect any one of these. Don't add any other viscera or body fluids to this list as far as routine is concerned. But if you are looking at uh, 
a particular case where you have some suspicion as to what kind of poisoning it is, then there may be some additional viscera that you need to collect. So you have, for instance, cerebrospinal fluid that should be collected if you suspect alcohol-related death. CSF as to how to collect it and all that is not uh, domain uh, as far as uh, this particular session is concerned. That is a domain of a forensic pathologist as to what are the things to be done at autopsy, how it is to be done, that's a different kind of thing. So here we will be only looking at what are the additional body fluids or viscera that need to be collected. As to how to go about collecting them, you will have to uh, visit a site which deals with forensic pathology or maybe consult and or reference sources on that. So cerebral spinal fluid or CSF for alcohol, for all neurotoxic poisons including alcohol, half of brain or one cerebral hemisphere is again recommended in addition to routine viscera, this is all in addition to routine viscera and body fluids. Spinal cord entire for spinal poisons like strychnine, one lung for inhaled poisons to be preserved in airtight container, 10 centimeter from long bone like femur for heavy metal poisoning, pulled hair, scalp or hair from other parts of the body is also alright, 15 to 20 strands for heavy metals again, affected portion of the skin in corrosive poisoning or injected poisons along with some underlying tissue also if possible, heart in the case of cardiac poisons. This is the complete list of viscera and body fluids. I think uh, you don't have to preserve anything else at autopsy. Depends on whether you have some idea as to what poison it is or you do not have some idea. I have given you the list, routine viscera as well as special viscera and body fluids in a case of suspected or confirmed poisoning. Now we look at uh, preservatives. What are the preservatives that you must use to preserve these viscera and send them to the laboratory because it may take some time for analysis and if you don't preserve properly, there can be decomposition of the, you know, viscera or body fluids and analysis becomes vitiated. So, what is generally recommended is for the viscera, rectified spirit or uh, saturated saline is usually saturated saline that is used in India. Rectified spirit is a little costly and subject to misuse or abuse. Rectified spirit, as you know, is ethyl alcohol. And for blood, it's a mixture of sodium fluoride and potassium oxalate. You call it fluoride oxalate mixture. For urine, it is sodium fluoride alone. This is what is usually recommended. But what I would say is, really speaking, what is desirable is just for all poisons, stomach and contents, blood maybe 10 ml, urine 50 ml, that's it. And recommended preservative, actually don't have to use any preservative, just cool the sample in ice. This is what is usually done in the West. In the West, we don't go about, you know, collecting all kinds of viscera and body fluids and preserving them in different kinds of preservatives, not really ideal. So I would suggest that in the examination, you stress on this. Stomach and contents, blood and urine, definitely in all cases, and the preservation as far as possible, nothing to be added. Cooling is enough. And uh, before we close, we will look at some of the aspects of homicidal poisoning, because naturally when you look at forensic toxicology, the most important aspect is uh, the possibility of misuse of poisons for murder or homicide. So homicidal poisoning as to why poisoning is considered to be an ideal method of committing murder because uh, unlike uh, weapons like knife or maybe some blunt weapon or maybe a firearm or whatever it is, which is easy to find out, you know, that there is foul play here and what is the kind of weapon used and investigation is relatively easier, not the case with poisons. Poisons, sometimes, you know, a doctor himself may not suspect it when a person dies of poisoning and police officers again may not realize that a particular death is to do with poisoning. So, poisoning is likely to be missed and that is why we need to know uh, that uh, poisons can be misused for serious crimes like murder. And these are the reasons uh, why poisoning is considered generally to be an ideal way of committing murder. Number one, some of the most potent poisons can be procured without difficulty. Uh, we'll come to the list later. Some poisons cause death in a manner that does not raise suspicion. Low awareness about poisons among law enforcement officers and even among doctors. False notions about poisons and poisoning. Difficulty in establishing cause of death in a case of poisoning. 
and some poisons can escape detection by even sophisticated methods of analysis. As a result of it, you can see from the list, all these, all these make poisoning a method that may not be very easy to detect uh, by the police or in the case of a doctor, he may not you know, suspect a particular person is suffering from poisoning because of all these kinds of features that make poisoning or poisons uh, an ideal kind of method to commit uh, murder. Let us look at uh, a list of commonly used homicidal poisons, not just in India but around the world. Poisons like uh, arsenic, cyanide, phosphorus, I think most people know about drugs like sedatives, opiates, that's narcotics, plant toxins like strychnine, datura, oleander, especially important in India, all these plants are very commonly encountered. And then you have rarely used but deadly homicidal poisons like thallium, carbon monoxide, drugs, you know, those which are listed here like tubercularin, succinylcholine, insulin, various kinds of cardiovascular drugs, especially digitalis, plant toxins like aconite castor, again digitalis, and unusual homicidal poisons like pesticides or laced alcohol, alcohol laced with some other, you know, chemical that can cause it to become a lethal substance. Snake venom. We have a case right now in Kerala where there is a high degree of suspicion that a man committed murder of his wife with the help of a snake by having the snake bite her. So snake venom can also be used. Sometimes a snake itself is used as a murder weapon or sometimes the snake venom is extracted and then injected into the victim. And then you have all kinds of microbial toxins. Which, which can be used also for murder and that can be very difficult to detect. Alright, we will close this particular uh, session with uh, some important points to remember with regard to chemical analysis because there are so many misconceptions. Number one, not all poisons can be detected by chemical analysis. It's not a magic wand that you can wave in the air and say, you know, abracadabra, this is the poison that, you know, is uh, responsible for the death. It's not so simple. Chemical analysis sometimes fails. And even if you get some result, it may be difficult sometimes to interpret correctly. Interpretation is not all that easy always. If you have selected or the doctor has selected the you know, wrong kind of visa for analysis, then the analysis is not going to be useful. Inappropriate preservation can also lead to vitiation of uh, chemical analysis. And if there's been a lot of delay in performing analysis, again, you know, the result can be vitiated. If there is no equipment that is uh, required for the analysis or the specific kind of equipment, then th that can again render the analysis as futile. And lack of qualified staff, even if everything else is in place, can lead to problems because, as I said, you know, interpretation is always very important, not just the performance of the analysis. So for all these reasons, please do remember, chemical analysis is not the panacea for solving a case of poisoning-related murder. So that is all in this particular session. We will meet again in session General Toxicology Part 3. Uh, that will be you know, a separate kind of session that will deal exclusively with management of poisoning, including decontamination procedures. So until then, goodbye. And uh, do uh, take a look at some of the slides again in this presentation uh, because information is really important pertaining to some of the aspects, uh, especially for medical students, for going for examinations in toxicology. Thank you and goodbye.